for technical problems. All right, welcome everyone to today's Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. My name is John Mueller. I am a Webmaster Trends Analyst at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these Office Hour Hangouts, where people can join in and ask their questions all around their websites and web search. Um, tons of stuff was submitted already. So I'll see if I can get some answers in to, to the things that we don't get to in, in the comments as well. Uh, but if any of you want to get started, you're welcome to jump in with first question. I can try one, I guess. All right, go for it. Yeah. Um, so uh, more of a theoretical one. Uh, let's say you have um, um, a store or, or maybe a site running, uh, I don't know, classified ads, something that's fairly big. Uh, it's doing very well, um, and it has it kind of targets a lot of topics. So if you have a marketplace or maybe a classified ads, you might have uh, pages regarding you know jobs, pages regarding selling uh, I don't know fashion items and things like that. Um, and uh, let's say you're doing fairly well for most of the uh, topics you're targeting, but um, most of the uh, websites that rank, you know, in the first positions are dedicated to that specific topic. So it's hard. Maybe it's hard to beat a fashion store with your just with your fashion section of your marketplace when you have all these other sections. Um, and uh, what would happen if that website decides, well, let's just create a new website uh, dedicated to just the fashion section that we have and we like run two websites in 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 Pell or something like that, uh, and that would mean that, like the content is kind of the same. So one product uploaded somewhere it uh, shows up on the other website as well. Um, how does Google treat this other than just two websites that you know have similar content? Does Google like look well? Is the same business running those two websites? Uh, does that play any role in how Google decides what to rank, what to index, and things like that? Um, I I don't think we would do anything special in a, in a case like that. We we would essentially try to treat it as two websites. Uh, with regards to whether or not that makes sense, I I think that's a bit of a different question because it's. I mean, some, sometimes it makes sense to have one really strong website that includes a lot of different topics. Sometimes it makes sense to, to focus a little bit more. And finally, that balance is more, I'd say, a, a marketing and kind of strategic problem rather than SEO problem. Um, because it, what won't happen is that it's like if you're ranking at number three, then suddenly you're ranking at number two and three. I don't think that would just happen automatically. But rather, usually you'd, you'd probably, I don't know, try to link to your other website or maybe redirect some pages to that new website that you have. And that kind of dilutes a little bit of the value of that big, strong website that you have and creates a little bit more value in that more concentrated website then. And whether or not that works well for search or that works well for users, that's, that's really hard to say ahead of time. Uh, with regards to two websites like that, I don't see a problem. Uh, if you're going in the direction of, like, I'll create 10 or 20 websites like that, then that's something where I could see the kind of quality algorithms kicking in and saying, oh, this looks a bit like doorway sites. We need to be careful here. But if it's just two websites, if you decide to go to three websites at some point, I, I don't really see a big problem there. Well, I'm asking since over here, um, most of the classified websites, um, they've also built websites dedicated to either the jobs section, or, or the jobs market, or the real estate market. Uh, so anything somebody posts an ad on, a classified ad on, uh, you know, the jobs section of the main uh, classified uh, site, it automatically appears on the job specific site as well. So it's like duplicating the section of your site and creating a whole other website for it. And 
I, I mean, they both seem to rank well. Uh, I mean, both sides seem to rank well for, you know, keywords related, let's say, to the job market and things like that. So I was wondering whether Google has any issues with that or, and, or might be any issues that somebody should take into account. I, I don't think we would have any issues by default. I, I think it's really more a, a kind of a strategic question. Do you, do you want to go down that direction or not? Uh, there's a lot of work involved with splitting things off and kind of duplicating things, finding the right balance between how much you duplicate, how much you don't. But it's like may, maybe that trade-off is, is overall positive for, for that site, for that situation. I don't know. It's hard to say. If it's duplicate, uh, so let's say the same pages, the same uh, you know content, classified ads show up on on both websites. Is there are there situations where Google might decide that well we've already seen this content and it's exactly the same on this other website it doesn't make much, make much sense to show both websites. Uh, yes, um, it, it, a really simplified way to look at it is if the snippet would be exactly the same in the search results, then it makes sense for us to filter one of those out. And uh, that depends a little bit on, on the query. If people are searching for something that is kind of more specific to, to one of these websites or not, um, that's that's usually kind of the, the simplified uh, approach to, to look at it. If you think that the snippet will look exactly the same, then we'll filter one of them out. If the snippet would be different, <coughs> sorry, then we, we would show them both. Uh, and if Google does decide to filter one of the sites out, is there any way to see that in Search Console? I don't think so. I mean, other than you just don't have any impressions for, oh. for that that query or or whatever like if you if you have two websites and you look at the query uh, statistics you can probably see from the impressions um like that does it match does it not match but it wouldn't show up the coverage section so the coverage section would should still show the websites as being indexed yeah just yeah yeah okay. they they would be indexed normally and if someone searches for I don't know, a, a keyword from the classified ad plus something from the location or something from the title, then we would just show that one. Or maybe if they search for something slightly more different to the other one, then we would show the other side. So mm -hmm. indexing would, would be fine. Um, it's really just showing in the search results that would be different. Um, with regards to indexing, what would be problematic is if the exact same page were used on both of these sites. Like if you use the same layout, the same HTML page, uh, if if that was exactly the same on both of these sites, then we would see that as duplicates because it's exactly the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thanks. Sure. All right. Any other questions before we jump into the submitted ones? Hi, John. Hi. Uh, uh, I have a question about uh, singular and plural form of keyword. So one of our clients, their keyword is Garden Shade Sydney and Garden Shade Sydney. Now, for Garden Shade Sydney, the category page, Garden Shade category page ranks on Google. But for the singular form, Garden Shade Sydney, one of the blog posts is ranking on Google instead of the category page. Why is this different? Both keywords are the same, just singular and plural. So why is that difference? Um, we, so, so it's hard to say w without looking into the exact details, but we, we would see those queries as being different. And uh, that's, I, I think, kind of, kind of the first step there. And uh, when we see them as being slightly different, then we, we might think that one or the other of these pages makes more sense to show. Uh, so usually, with with singular and plural, we we do recognize that they're synonyms, um, more or less. Um, but uh, we also recognize that that maybe there's something kind of unique to to one of them or to the other one, uh, such as if you're looking for a plural, maybe you're looking more for like a list or a comparison page or um, maybe a, a category page of different kinds of of these items. Uh, so that's something where our systems try to take that into account. 
And uh, it can result in slightly different results being shown for one or the other. Uh, it's, it's a bit tricky when you're in that situation. You're like, oh, but I want my other page to rank instead of this one. And you don't want to remove the, the page that you currently have ranking. Uh, that's something where you, I don't know, you, you can't really force that other than to, to tweak things subtly, that you kind of make sure that the, the right words, the right phrasing is on these pages, that you link them internally properly. Um, but that's, that's sometimes kind of tricky. Uh, it's also worth keeping in mind that uh, just because when, when you take a step back, that these words or these queries sound very similar and they seem very much the same, it might well be that users do treat them as different queries and do expect different kinds of results. Uh, so if kind of like before just jumping in and saying, oh, I need to have the same page rank for both of these, um, maybe check with some other people to see, does it make sense to change this? Or is this something where it's actually not that bad? Or another thing you could do is the page that's currently ranking, um, put some kind of a call to action on it and say, like, hey, if you're looking for this, like, also check out this other page. Um, and another question, uh, John. So we have a client uh, who they, they are a startup management company. Now they have a business in five states in Australia. For each state, they have different website, and they have one corporate website. Now, their corporate website has a block, but the other website does not have any block. Now, the corporate website, the block of the corporate website, if gives link to the state website, will there be any, any problem? So, what was the last part? Okay, so the the block of the corporate site gives link to the state website. Will that be a problem? OK, so the, the blog just links to, to one of them, or to all of them, or? Uh, it depends. Uh, not, uh, it, don't, they don't give a link every time. When it's necessary, they just give a link to one of the state site, okay. if it is relevant to that site. I, I don't see a problem offhand with that. I'm, I, I think this kind of setup that you have one, one big corporate site for kind of the, the overgroup, and then the individual locations or the individual sub companies, a separate websites, and them kind of linked together. I think that's that's pretty common. That's not not something I, I would consider problematic. Okay. Thank you, John. Sure. All right. Let me run through some of the submitted questions. And as always, if you have any comments or more questions along the way, feel free to jump in. And towards the end. Hopefully, we'll have some time for other questions from you all. Uh, our website and our content are, is quite usually getting copied by someone else. They basically just create a new domain and copy the whole website on it. Is there something, apart from disavowing these sites, that we can do? Can we submit these sites as duplicates so Google won't har harm our results and sites as a result? Um, I, I think this is always kind of tricky. The general approach that I would try to take here is to see if there's something uh, from a legal point of view that you can do to essentially tackle the problem at source. Uh, because if the website is no longer up, if it's no longer being indexed, then that's essentially uh, a solution for search as well. So I would double check with uh, whoever you work with on the legal side with regards to things like DMCA and copyright uh, to see if there's something that, that you can do there. Um, with regards to kind of like the location of the website, if they're hosted in other countries, all of those things, uh, that might might be an issue with regards to kind of the the full legal process. Uh, but with regards to how Google kind of processes these reports, generally that's that's less than, of an issue. So that would be kind of the the first step that I would take there, and uh, alternately. Uh, what, what you could do is, of course, uh, submit these with the web spam report. Uh, with the web spam report, it's important to keep in mind that this is not something that we go through one one on one and kind of manually review everything and throw all of these sites out. Uh, for a large part, these are used essentially to, to train our algorithms to, to improve over time. Uh, so just because you submit something to the web spam report, I wouldn't expect 
that to kind of be you know, rem removed automatically after a couple of days or something like that. Uh, but those are kind of the, the approaches that I would take there. Uh, with uh, regards to disavowing uh, those sites, if they're linking to your website and you really don't want that link to be taken into account, then using the disavow tool is fine. Uh, if they don't link to your website, if they're just copying your website, then there is nothing really there to disavow. Um, uh, hi, John. Can I have yes. a follow-up question to that? Sure. Uh, yeah, all right. So uh, there might not be a possibility to take those legal steps you're talking about. But when it comes to Google, is there some possibility Google will harm our website? or? Can Google see that our website has history and is much bigger, uh, has much more authority than the copies, and so therefore it's basically okay? I don't know about basically okay um, because, like you, you submitted this question. It sounds like you were seeing some problems, uh, but yes, we we do usually try to figure that out. It's, it's really common that sites get copied on the web. And it's important for us that we can work out which, which of these versions should be shown in search and which ones we, we can kind of filter out. All right. So basically, the only step we can take is to submit the website to the spam report, and that's it, right? Yeah. I, I would still double check to see if DMCA works. Just to to kind of make sure that you you're covering all of the bases, uh, in particular the the report through through Google, um, because that that is something that uh, from our side the legal team reviews. And if it's really one to one copy of your website, then that's something where maybe they'd be able to to help resolve that. Mm -hmm. It's MCA, DMCA. Yes. Oh, DMCA. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, OK, Does, is, is a category counted as duplicate content if it's indexed on Google? Uh, no, not, not necessarily. Like On a category page, you might have individual items that you have on your individual item pages. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that it's duplicate content. Uh, I think duplicate content is, is kind of a tricky term anyway, because people often frame it as like, oh, this is bad for your website. This will harm your website. Uh, just because something is recognized as duplicate content or if parts of a page are recognized as duplicate content isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's, uh, it basically just tells us, well, we've seen this before. And if someone is searching for something in this block of text that's duplicated, we need to find out which of the pages that have that copy of text are the most relevant. And it's not the case that a website will be thrown out of search just because it has some duplicate content. Uh, because essentially, every website has some amount of duplicate content that's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's almost impossible to avoid. Uh, we've been doing quite a bit of speed optimization on our page. And we managed to get a consistent over 90 score in our performance in Lighthouse. Um, but this is only without our ad stack enabled. Uh, once we turn it on, we drop in the performance scores to below 10. Uh, we've debated this at uh, length with our ad provider, but they insist there is little they can do if we want monetization. We've done a bit of research and found that many face similar challenges with different ad stacks. Uh, so here is my question. Is anyone in the 90 plus range for speed in Lighthouse that has ads? It feels pointless to further optimize the page for speed uh, with the limitation that the ad stack prevents. Um, and then there are some examples. Um, so I, I didn't check these pages explicitly. But uh, essentially, when, when it comes to, to speed, uh, we, we do take the pages into account the way that we get them. So if if you have ads on these pages and the ads are the thing that makes the pages slow, then we see those pages as being slow. Uh, so that's something, I don't know, just, just kind of worth keeping in mind. Uh, with regards to the absolute score there, it's, it's also worth keeping in mind that uh, especially the um, kind of the 0 to 100 score that you have, I think, in PageSpeed Insights is something that's more of a kind of a guideline for finding it, the different types of issues. And it's probably worth more looking at things like the, the Core Web Vitals, where you have a little bit ex explicit uh, numbers to, to work on. 
Um, but uh, I, I mean, I don't know offhand uh, which websites have really high scores and use ads. But the Chrome user experience report data, that is something that's public. And I, I believe you could even download that, and you can double check like different sites from your country and see how they are performing. Uh, you can also use the HTTP archive. That also has a full Lighthouse uh, performance reports in there. Uh, so you can look at things over time for other websites if you want. Uh, so that's something where, from, from my point of view, if you're worried about one specific ad provider, that's something that you can often test across different providers and see how other websites are performing. Um, so Maybe just to add on that, because so far we haven't really found anyone in our, uh, neither in our industry nor in our country region that leverage ads and have reasonable uh, lighthouse speed, uh, basically, grades. So it seems really frustrating because we've spent so much time on optimizing. And really, the only thing that seems to be preventing us is actually the only thing that makes us money on the page. So it's a pretty yeah. uh, frustrating trade off, to be honest. Yeah, I, I can understand that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's always tricky. But it's, I mean, the, on, the, on the other hand, the, the good part there is uh, for the things that you're competing with, with other people, they, they have the same problems, right? Uh, so it's not exactly, because we're also competing with government agencies that don't do ads. OK. So since well, we're a weather provider, basically, you have government weather services that don't need to monetize. OK. Then maybe you have to be more creative. Now, I, I don't have any exact answer, so it's not. It's not from our side that we're saying ads are bad, and you should remove your ads so that you get a good score, so that you can rank well in search. It's really just we, we need to make sure that when people search for something and they click on a result, they find the answers that they need on those pages reasonably quickly. That's kind of what, what we're looking at. And maybe, maybe there are other ways that you can monetize things in, in a way that doesn't prevent the, the kind of the primary loading of the page. So, Especially if you're looking at, uh, what is it, uh, largest meaningful content? I forgot what the names are. There's like so many. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that might be something where maybe deferred loading of the ads would be an option. We are doing that. OK. It's actually been a large discussion with our ad provider because they always want to be in the head. Uh, <laughs> and so we've been debating that. But still, we are getting these bad lighthouse scores, which is surprising to me. Uh, but I, I'm also wondering if the scores are perfectly correct here. But really, we've been basically pushing back the ad stack as much as we can. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the score from 0 to 100 is kind of arbitrary because it's, not, it's, it's kind of a weighted score of different factors that are involved there. Uh, it's probably easier to look at exact scores where, which are based more on kind of timing and those those kind of things to especially when you're kind of fine tuning the optimization there, uh, because things like oh was this served from a CDN or not is like it, it doesn't really matter as long as it gets there fast enough. I think you're also going to use those as a ranking signal in the future, so that has us additionally scared in a way. Um, yeah, I mean we. We do use speed as a ranking factor on mobile already. It's more a matter of, is this page reasonably fast or not? Uh, with regards to the core web vitals, the, the new ones that we announced, they're part of the page experience uh, score, which is kind of what we plan to use uh, with regards to speed and ranking at some point in the future. We, we kind of haven't announced a date for this yet. Um, and we'll announce the date at least, I think, six months before we actually turn it on uh, so that you have a bit of time to, to figure the, those details out if you feel that you, you need to do something there. And uh, the page experience benchmark is based on, I think, a percentile of from, from the site's point of view. So it's not that you need to optimize every millisecond, but rather it's like you need to be in, in the green range and then so like if you're in the beginning or the end of the green range, that's more or less OK. Thank you. Sure. If I can intervene a bit, um, I, I ran the site through, 
through Lighthouse. Um, so uh, one thing that I think you can do, I ran the ads version, the one with the ads. So I don't see ads as being an issue in the sense that uh, you're not showing above the fold ads, at least on mobile, from what I noticed. So that shouldn't affect the uh, largest contactful paint metric, which just that is like 25% uh, weighted uh, um, in the score of the overall performance score. Uh, but I, what I noticed is that you're showing a, a cookie uh, kind of banner. Uh, so that shows up a lot later and that affects how uh, LCP, the large content for paint is, is calculated because your FCP, first content for paint is like one second, but your largest content for paint is almost seven seconds. And that's only because it, uh, Google uh, or I mean, PageSpeed Insights Lighthouse calculates uh, when it's when the uh, that cookie pop up shows up. So uh, it, I think you're not seeing the worst of it because you're in a geo area where we don't have uh, okay. sort of our primary ad stack. So you will be seeing something else than I'm seeing because I'm in a region where there's a lot of stuff happening in the ad stack and you're just in the backfill mode. I guess well, you're not in Austria, I suppose. I tested with PageSpeed Insights as well, so I don't know if for the US you also have a different. Yeah. So, so with regards to location, that's also a good point. Um, we we use essentially, or, or the plan to, is to use the Chrome User Experience Report data, which is based on kind of the the normal users that are accessing mm -hmm. your site. So. Uh, one thing you don't have to worry about is like whether or not people in the US have fast access because that's where Google is based, but really it's like where your users are based, that's kind of where you need to watch out for speed. And I guess it sounds like that's that's the place where it's the, the hardest on speed, which is kind of tricky. Yeah. <laughs> Andres, if you can uh, start a thread on the webmaster forums, I can happily take uh, uh, deeper look into it and sure. maybe find some uh, some suggestions. Sounds good. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. All right. Uh, does having three open and closed HTML tags in a page negatively affect Google's ability to determine the main page content of a page? Uh, no. So this is essentially a matter of kind of like, is there valid HTML on the page or not? And that's not something that we would use with regards to kind of ranking at all. The only time the, the valid HTML or not plays a role is if you have specific meta tags or specific uh, attributes that need to be in the head of a page. And because the HTML is so invalid that the head of the page is kind of slipping into the body of the page, uh, then we might not be able to confirm that these tags are actually in the head. Uh, so for example, if you have hreflang attributes uh, on the page and uh, the head of the page is so broken that we think it's a part of a body, then we would assume that these hreflang attributes are not actually valid because we, we can't find them in the head of the page. So that's kind of the, the one situation where valid HTML would play a role. Um, but otherwise, it, it wouldn't play a role at all with regards to ranking Google. Well, let me just correct. One other place where that would play a role is when you're looking at things like structured data, where you need to have the HTML structured in a specific way so that we can extract the structured data properly. Uh, but that's kind of like if it's not, it would result in that structured data not being valid, which essentially would be the primary problem. It's not that the HTML has to be valid, but rather the structured data has to be valid. Uh, is, it okay, is it possible uh, for a domain to be punished if a site removes a lot of articles and makes them 404 due to some legal action or author requests? Uh, no. So removing content is essentially it's, is perfectly fine. It's part of the normal web. Uh, the only kind of punishment, if you will, that you will see is that obviously once this content is removed from our index, you won't rank for that content or for the content that used to be there. Uh, but it's not that the rest of your site's content would be ranked worse just because you have a lot of 404 errors. Uh, 404 errors are essentially part of the normal web. It's not something where which we would take as a sign that the website is low quality or bad or anything like that. 
Uh, could the change of address tool be used in some way for migration where you're consolidating two domains down to one? Uh, trying to think outside of the box on this. Um, I could see a situation where possibly you could use the change of address tool like this uh, in the sense that like, you, you could probably set up the configuration of your sites to make it so that we would process the change of address tool there, because there, there's some requirements that we look out for with the change of address tool, such as that you have a one-to-one -one redirect from the old site to the new site. Uh, but you could theoretically set something like that up. Whether or not that makes sense, I don't know, um, because the tool is really meant to transfer essentially all of the signals from one site to the other site. And the idea is kind of to replace the, the new site with the old site. And uh, if you're consolidating multiple domains, then it's not that you're replacing the new site with the old site's information, but rather that you want kind of like everything added together. And uh, that's something where I could imagine you might be able to use a tool kind of like from a practical point of view. You can, you can access it. You can click OK and make it, make it kind of activated. But I don't know if you would have any positive effect over just redirecting normally. My, my feeling is probably you would see some weird effects. But uh, I don't know if overall you would have kind of something positive out of that. Um, we fixed some really old product URLs with 301 redirects and see some huge spikes in backlinks. How does Google react to this? Uh, we're seeing some substantial decline in ranking after that. Is it related? Um, I Usually, changing URLs on your website, uh, fixing old URLs, redirecting them to make them valid, that's, that's perfectly fine. That's not something that I would say would be problematic. Uh, it wouldn't be something that we would say is, is a sign of spam. Definitely not, because you're improving your website. Um, my, my feeling is the decline in ranking is probably unrelated to, to fixing the URLs on your website, but maybe something that uh, was, was happening anyway. It's kind of independent of that. Uh, so I, I would continue to improve the URLs on your website, fix them with redirects if you notice that they were kind of like linked incorrectly, those kind of things. Uh, if there's a domain whose archives shows some different themes and content than the current theme and content, should we consider that kind of domain is good for backlink purpose? Um, so I don't know what, what you would consider good for backlink purpose. That, that's kind of the, the part where I'm like a little bit stuck. Uh, but essentially, just because the cache page looks slightly different than the current page, that's not a bad sign. Uh, that's usually a sign that, that the website is being worked on, that things are changing. That's perfectly normal. Uh, with regards to good for backlink purposes, it sounds like you're dropping links on other sites. And that's kind of the bad thing. It's not so much that the website is being worked on, but rather if you just go out and you add, add links to other people's sites, that would be kind of not, not so cool. Um, since a couple of months, the favicon of my site disappeared from mobile search results while it keeps being shown in Search Console. I checked the Google guidelines, and everything seems OK. The only thing that changed in the same period is that I changed the URL structure from www.site.info to www site.info slash em, uh, since I have multilingual versions, all with their own sitemap. Uh, so the root is no longer being indexed. It 301 redirects to slash em. Um, could that be the reason? I don't know. That's actually an interesting question. I, I haven't uh, looked into uh, how, how that would be handled. So. I think on, on the one side, the one of the things I've noted with favicons is that it just takes a lot of time to be processed. So if you make changes with the favicon, if you fix something, if you change the URL, uh, then that's something that takes quite a bit of time to actually be reprocessed. Uh, so if, if you made this change, I don't know, a month or two ago, 
it's it's possible that that's still being processed. Uh, on the other hand, it it feels kind of weird that if you don't have a a root URL, but rather kind of like you're redirecting to some lower level page, if that's the only change that you made, then that seems like something that we should be able to deal with. I, I am online. Okay, cool. Can you yeah. make? Can you drop me a, a link to your site, maybe in the chat, and I can yeah. I can pick it up afterwards yeah. and and double check with the team. Yeah, yeah. Because the, one of the requirements uh, for the Favicon is that the the root must be uh, crawling crawl, crawlable, you know, by Google. And uh, my actual route, so the, the the domain is is not indexed because uh, I have two home pages, one uh, uh, for one language and the other for the other language, and so on. So the basic, uh, if you dial, you know, if you type the the ba basic uh, home page, you get a three or one redirect to the default language that is the English uh, version. And so actually, the the real uh, route is not. Uh, crawlable by Google, but uh, the English uh, version, yes. So th that was the question: if it is this an impact? Yeah. Uh, I, yes. I don't know. I. It's the first time I I hear about this uh, this configuration, but I'm I'm happy to take a look with with the team. Yeah. But is it a bad configuration having uh, just a home page on different language and not the 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 naked the domain? In it's. It's essentially fine. It's not something that that I would say is problematic. I think sometimes it, it it might confuse tools if you're running tools over the website and you don't really have that root home page. Uh, but from from a search point of view, this is something that a lot of websites do. Um, so what one thing you might want to do is look at hreflang and use the x default for kind of the primary version that you have. Uh, but that's I don't know, kind of like small optimization. It's not something that, that is critical okay. or that you need to do. I will drop you the, the align. Thanks. Sure. Thanks. Um, I want to know that I update my website every day with a new post, and Google indexes the post, but not the keywords of that post. So can I know the reason behind that? Uh, I don't know. It's hard to say just based on, on that question. So if we're indexing the content of a page, then we essentially have that page indexed. And we could show it in the search results for any searches that are made for that content. Uh, what might happen, or I guess depending on kind of the keywords that you're targeting, is that if you create something completely new, that it doesn't immediately rank for kind of competitive keywords. So uh, that's something that feels kind, kind of normal uh, from that point of view. So maybe it's a matter of just taking more time, working out ways to improve your content overall, and uh, kind of growing your website from there rather than just creating new content every day and hoping to rank for the keywords that you have in that, in that new piece of content. Uh, but it's not something where I would say we have any systems uh, on our side that say, oh, we will index all of this content, but we won't show it for any of the keywords for it. Because if we want to kind of index it, then we want to index it with the, the ultimate goal of showing that in search. It doesn't make any sense for us to index something that we wouldn't want to show. Um, my my website is in Marathi, Indian language, and will it get indexed for the English English translated queries? Uh, so if if your website is completely in one language, then generally we we wouldn't be showing it for queries made in other languages. Uh, there there are always I guess some exceptions to this and uh, some situations where we do kind of this kind of thing where we recognize that someone is searching in one language, but we can't find any content in that language. And therefore, we will translate that query into uh, maybe another local language and try to see if we can find something there. I, I believe that's something that we've done. I don't know if we still do it uh, in India in particular, where maybe there is not a lot of local content yet. But if we translate the query into English and we can show English pages using Google Translate, perhaps, then that's something that might make sense there. 
Um, but in general, if you're working on your website and you want to rank for queries in a particular language, then I would strongly recommend that you actually also write your content in that language. Uh, using things like hreflang lets you connect those different language versions. Um, but uh, essentially, having content in a particular language version, if you want to be shown for queries in that language, that's really important. And that's especially important when it comes to more competitive terms, uh, where there is a lot of content already in one language. Then like, you really need to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward, that you're creating the content as ideal as possible so that, on the one hand, our systems can look at it and say, oh, this matches exactly what the user was looking for. And users, when they go to your pages, they're like, oh, this is fantastic content. Uh, this is something I need to recommend to my friends, for example. Um, my website is only restricted to the US demographic. Can I bring links for my site from outside of the US country? Um, again, kind of this, can I bring links to my website? That sounds a lot like I would like to randomly create links on the web uh, pointing at my website. And I want Google to think that these links are natural. Um, which is kind of more the, the, the problematic aspect there. With regards to restricting a website to the US, that's something you can do. Um, in general, we crawl websites from the US in, in most situations. Uh, so if we can access the web page, we would be able to index it. I think it's a bit, I don't know, tricky or n not, not always that great of a user experience when people outside of the US click on a search result like this, and they essentially can't access the website. Um, but uh, this is so sometimes you, you need to do things like this uh, for legal reasons. Um, the, I, I guess the problematic alternative to this, uh, just to, to have mentioned that as well, is if you have a website that is being crawled from Googlebot in the US and you want to block users in the US from accessing the page, uh, then Googlebot wouldn't be able to access it either, and we wouldn't be able to index it. So that's kind of if you were in the other situation where you needed to block users in the US. Uh, but with regards to links in general, if people are linking to your website, uh, then that's something that we take into account regardless of where those links are located. Uh, from, for multilingual blog, which is best, subdomain or subdirectory, and how to configure that in Search Console? Oh my gosh. I don't know if I want to start this fight again. Um, essentially, when, when it comes to multilingual websites, we don't care what the structure of your website is. So that's something where if you feel it makes more sense to do, do it on different subdomains, then go for it. If you feel it makes more sense on subdirectories, go for that. If you want to use URL parameters, that's fine too. So for different languages, any URL structure works as long as you have one language per URL. Uh, so as long as you don't have this fancy setup that your website on the same URL returns with different language content depending on the user location, uh, because we would not be able to index that. Uh, on the other hand, if you were targeting multiple countries, so not, not multiple languages but multiple countries, then we need to have a clear structure of the website for individual countries, uh, which means, again, subdom subdomain or subdirectories would be the approach to take. And in Search Console, you would need to specify or kind of verify those separate sections and specify the geotargeting of those sections. Uh, so for multiple languages, any structure you want is fine. Uh, for multiple countries, you need to use subdomains or subdirectories or different domains, even, if that works for you. Um, I have a client that has one of their navigation options as a JavaScript dynamic URL. So if someone clicks on media in their navigation, they land on slash media page. But all the resources and the blogs live on slash media type equals blog, et cetera. I know Googlebot is smart when crawling JavaScript, but some SEOs say it's best to have clean URLs with paths like slash media slash news. 
Um, how good or bad is it to have the navigation this dynamic for SEO? Uh, I also read about kind of hash bang on Google's blog. I feel my lack of computer science made this topic a blur to me. So uh, on the last part, that's perfectly fine. Uh, like we strongly don't recommend using hash bang anymore. Uh, so that setup is something I would not, not bother looking into. You don't have to kind of worry about your computer science skills for that. Uh, with regards to dynamic URLs or not, I think, as I understand it, the problem is less that it's based on JavaScript, but rather that you have the question mark in the URL, and then you have type, type equals blog, or kind of different parameters within the URL rather than just files and directories. And from our point of view, that's perfectly fine. That's not something that you need to change. Uh, so kind of these URLs with parameters or URLs without parameters, from our point of view, they're essentially all equivalent. They rank exactly the same in search. Uh, sometimes it's even like if we talk with the crawling and indexing teams at Google, they tell us people should not try to hide these kind of parameters, because having parameters in your URLs makes it a lot easier for our systems to actually crawl and index them. And the reason for that is that we can recognize that these parameters are unique elements of a URL. And our systems can learn, does this parameter make sense? Is this something that is critical for crawling and indexing of the page, or can we remove it? And by, by learning these kind of things across a website, it's easier for us to crawl more efficiently. So if you have kind of everything in a path of a URL, then it's hard for us to say, well, this path element, the fifth one in the line, uh, is something that we can drop or kind of simplify for crawling and indexing, because like, it's a part of the path. And theoretically, it's something completely different. It might lead to a different script on the server, all of that. Uh, however, if it's a part of a parameter in a URL, it's like question mark type equals media or, um, I don't know, page equals two, then that's something that our systems can learn. And they can understand that this is critical for the page or this is less critical for a page. And we can optimize our crawling and indexing based on that. Uh, so it's definitely not necessary to go from parameter URLs to kind of like just pure uh, file name or directory URLs. I think sometimes it makes sense to have cleaner URLs uh, just for users, because sometimes users copy and paste URLs, and they share them, or they link to them. And having really nice and clean URLs makes, makes it a little bit easier. Uh, for the most part, I feel URLs themselves in search are a little bit overrated because they're less and less visible in the search results. Uh, in browsers, they're less and less visible as well. Uh, so that's something where things like using breadcrumb markup will probably have a stronger effect with regards to the visual identity in search uh, when it comes to individual URLs. So I guess. I drifted off a little bit on a tangent there. But uh, essentially, having these kind of parameter URLs or having clean URLs is essentially fine. There's no need to kind of force it one way or the other. Um, OK, we're kind of running towards the end, and tons of questions left. I Like, like I said, I'll try to go through these and add some comments as well on, on YouTube. Uh, for all of the things that, that we don't get to. Uh, but uh, if any of you want to kind of jump on in with more questions live, feel free to do so. I also have a little bit more time afterwards if any of you want to stick around and maybe ask some questions uh, more or off the record, I guess. Hi, John. Are you able to hear me? Hi, yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask uh, uh, more about 301 and 404. Uh, we have got more than 1,000 pages in our website. That is 404. And uh, we would like to solve them. And uh, those, pages, those pages are also getting linked back from external websites. And uh, I wanted to know how we can solve that thing, because that is out of our control, because they are external links. And uh, 
uh, what should we do? Should we add 301 redirects to all the, uh, to all thousand pages to the relevant pages, or whether I mean, I also the, the my my concern is whether this will increase our crawl buzzard or not. So if they're already returning 404, then we essentially don't use any of those links to those pages. It's not that they cause any problems. Uh, essentially, you can keep it like that. If, they're, if you've replaced what used to be there with new pages or with different pages, then using a redirect is the right approach there. Yeah, uh, so for do have some, some related pages, yeah. 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 So if, if like the, the old page is one product version, and then you stopped selling that product, and it went 404, and now you have a new version that replaces the old version, then redirecting from the old URL to a new one is, is perfectly fine. I think that's good for users. That's good for search as well. Uh, what will happen then is any external links that were pointing at the old version, they will be forwarded to the new version. And that's, yeah. that's essentially OK. Uh, but just going in and saying, like, I have 1,000 404s. I will redirect them all to my home page. Uh, that's something where our systems, when they look at that, they will say, well, it doesn't look like your home page has replaced these pages. It's more that you're doing this as a way of kind of having a 404 page uh, that just shows you as a home page. And in a case like that, we would probably treat that as a soft 404, uh, which means internally we would say, this is essentially the same as a normal 404, and we would just drop those pages and drop those links or anything that was associated with that. So if you have a replacement, use a redirect. If you don't have a replacement, using a 404 is perfectly fine. Uh, and what about the call, call budget, whether it will increase our call budget of our website? I don't think it would change anything. Um, um, yeah. Because if it's like if it's a 404, we would probably crawl a little bit less often over time. Um, but uh, if it's a 301 that we treat as a soft 404, for example, that's all the same. I don't think uh, I don't think you would notice any big difference. Even if if the website had millions and millions of pages that were like this, I I don't think you would notice a big impact on crawl budget. Okay. Fine. Thanks a lot, John. Sure. I can I ask a question. Sure. Is, is there any uh, negative impact on blocking uh, with the uh, robots txt resources that we think they are not uh, to be indexed uh, by Google, like uh, the the cookies, JavaScript, uh, some other pop-ups? Uh, or other stuff that we think it's not worthy, so we block with robots, or Google is not so happy that we he cannot download some resources? Um, ultimately, that's fine. What, what's important for us is that we can render the page and see, for example, that it's mobile friendly or not. So if, by default, you're blocking all of the CSS and all of the JavaScript, and that makes your HTML page kind of unreadable on, on mobile devices, then we would think this is not mobile friendly. Uh, but if we can render the page and we can tell, oh, this is a normal mobile page, and it's just like one JavaScript file or one data file that you access, you need to block it, that's, that's perfectly fine. Thanks. Sure. John, can I ask a question, please? Sure. Um, it's a question about site links. Uh, it was actually posted in the um, in the comments. But um, is there anything we can do as webmasters about the text that is underneath individual site links? Because it's throwing out gibberish for one of my clients, and they're querying it. So, oh no. Okay. If it's if it's really gibberish, it would be great to to have some examples of that. Uh, usually, site links are based on the structure of the website as we can recognize it. Uh, so that means it's something where we maybe found a link that was going to one of those pages using an anchor text like that uh, within the website. Um, that's something where if, if you're seeing pure gibberish, then it sounds like we're not able to, to recognize maybe the anchor text on some of those pages, which could be maybe something weird with regards to JavaScript. It could be maybe something weird with regards to the encoding of the kind of characters on the page, uh, especially if it's 
something in, I don't know, non-English or non kind of the seven bit ASCII character set, uh, then sometimes it, it can happen that we pick up the encoding wrong. And then the anchor text obviously will also be wrong. Uh, what I've also sometimes seen is depending on how you link pagination within a website, uh, sometimes we'll just take like number seven and use that as a site link because we think this is particularly relevant. Um, because maybe you're linking to all paginated pages from all pages of the website, then we think, well, number seven is as good as number five, so maybe we'll just link with number seven. Um, that can also happen. But if it's okay. if the internal linking is really fine, if you use a kind of a crawler of your own to crawl the site, you can tell the anchor texts are all OK, and we're picking up something that really doesn't make sense, then that would be something to to pass on to the team. OK, well, I'll double check all that and um, send you a link or a screenshot or something. Cool. Sounds okay, good. OK, thanks. Cheers. Sure. All right. Getting kind of quiet. OK, so maybe I'll just pause the recording here. If any of you want to, you're welcome to stick around for a bit longer. Um, like I mentioned, I'll try to go through some of the other submitted questions and add some comments where I can to catch up a little bit there, since there's so much stuff. Um, but in any case, I hope you found this useful um, and would love to see some of you again in some of the future Hangouts again. Uh, thanks for joining, and wish you all a great weekend. Bye.